All right, good morning. Sorry, it took me a minute. Oh, there's no screens. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, so I guess we only have one screen today. Okay. Um, Okay, I um, have posted on the unit one, exam one, the unit one feedback. So please fill that out. That is about the previous test and the unit that we just completed. Um, originally the due date was actually today. And so it's gonna be on Friday. So do try to fill that out as soon as you can. Um, that will be um, great feedback for me to make any changes, improvements. Um, you know, I want to try and optimize your learning as much as possible. So please just be very candid. I do not take offense to anything that's said. Um, I use it just to help with improvements in the class. So just do be as candid as possible. Um, and then up above is the unit two that I have updated. So Today will be due that assignment for the week seven discussion. Several of you have already seen that, but if you have not completed that, please do submit a discussion um, question for this for, for today. And then um, the Laplace transform method number one and two, these assessments are partial fraction expansion. So do complete those two. Um, and then tomorrow will be the quiz for the partial fraction expansion. So it will be just here's the equation and it will ask you to do the partial fraction expansion for that quiz. So that's really all we've covered in detail. And then next um, week will be the fall break. And so we'll have a week off. And then the following week, there's gonna be again, a discussion eight for that Monday. And then also an assessment. And then Tuesday will be another quiz. Okay, any questions on upcoming material? Hey, do you guys love that you actually know all the material you need for um, the next exam? It's just, we're gonna do lots and lots of practice. <laughs> so partial fraction expansion is used in solving the problems when we use the Laplace method. So we wanna kind of get that down and then we're gonna move back to um, looking at the actual circuit and deriving the equations and then using that partial fraction expansion if we need to, to solve those equations there. Any, any questions about anything up to now? Okay. All right. All right, so last time we talked about partial fraction expansion. Um, we talked about um, the summary of the method that we wanna use in Laplace transform. So again, that summary is you transform the circuit into the S domain, you use KVL, KCL, node voltage, any of the other techniques we've already known to set up that equation in the S domain. And now we've moved to sometimes that equation is a little bit hard to match up with that Laplace table. So in order to match it up with the Laplace table to manipulate that, we're looking at that partial fraction expansion method to be able to manipulate it into that form. So if it's easy to match up, just manipulate the equation to get it to match up auto automatically, um, but most of the time it won't be where we'll have to use that partial fraction expansion. Then from there, we're gonna use the table to transform it back into the time domain. And then that's the solution and it should match up. If we just have a second order, it should match up to the same technique that we used for the second order. But this method allows us to have inputs that are not necessarily just a DC input. It can have any type of AC signal. It can have a combination of DC steps or ramps, anything like that. Um, so definitely can be a very complex input. 
And then it can be more than just two elements, which was what we looked at before. So it can have a fifth order. We don't have to go through by hand and do all of the differentials and the integration to get the solution for any variable in there. So very powerful technique that is much nicer than trying to do all the derivatives and integrations. So um, we went through and we solved this circuit. And then we started to look at the partial fraction expansion. So we looked at when we have the form of just A over S, B over S plus two, C over S plus four. So each one of those was the roots. And then we talked about poles and zeros. And remember the zeros are, are the, in the numerator. When you have a root in the numerator, it's a zero. And the poles will be when you have a root in the, that's the right one, right? Numerator's top, denominator, okay. Denominator on the bottom. And so the poles in this case is a pole at zero, a pole at minus two, and a pole at negative four. All right, for this one, what is the poles and zeros? It, so the pole is gonna be in negative two and we have how many of them? We have three of them. So it would just be, it's called a repeated root. How do we find the zeros? That factorization doesn't look very easy to me. The nice, not so nice equation. Yeah, over there. So like the third root would be the n, the second root would be n minus plus one, and the first root would be n minus two. So this s plus two q. Does that make sense? Uh huh. So those are not roots. These are going to be the um, just the expansion coefficients. So to find the root, yep, we have to use the quadratic formula. Mm -hmm. So the quadratic formula, you can use calculator or if you remember it by memorizing the uh, equation, then the form of AX squared plus BX plus C equals to zero is a minus B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus four AC all over two A. So you can memorize the formula or you can use a calculator. Um, and we can get this form and that will be our roots for the zeros. I have room down here. This is the notes from last time. So it's, uh, let's see what it's called, lecture seven. Make sure I did post it. Lecture six. Oh, it is lecture six. Yeah. It's the same as what we did last time. Lecture six. Thank you. I named it lecture seven because these are going to be the notes for today. Did you find it, Edison? Okay, great. Yeah, so these are lecture six notes. Um, they weren't updated. So, let's see. Okay. So, All right, so looking at the roots of this, then we have, this is gonna be my A, this is gonna be my B, and this will be my C. So solving this for S, we have a minus B, so that would be 15, plus or minus the square root of 15 squared, minus four times four times minus 10, all over two times four.
So you'll get a value when it, you add it and a value when you subtract that square root. Whatever those values are, that will be your zeros. And remember when you look at this, it's like looking at it just on the imaginary and real plane. And so 15 plus or minus, that's a big number. That's gonna be some negative number or some positive. So we're gonna have minus minus, so that will be a real value. So the zero, there'll be one over here, zero over here somewhere. And then at minus two, you're going to get three holes that just overlap each other. So this would be how you would graph this as far as the locations of the roots on the system. Questions? Yes. We need to, like, we need to actually know how to graph the zeros and holes. Um, yeah, I understand the show you kind of graph it up with it. So they become relevant um, in 2280 and then 3510, if you really get there. Um, just, I'm introducing you to them. I won't, I won't really have you graph them. So we're gonna look and focus more on the solution of the, of, the, of the circuit itself. And knowing that there is pole and zero. So that's what I want you to expect from you is to be able to figure out what are those poles and zeros if I asked you that question. All right, so now we have this problem and we wanna take the inverse Laplace. So go ahead and break up into small groups and work on trying to set this up to solve for the inverse bus. I cross multiply them and I just find the each order. Sorry, just one sec, let me make sure. What's your name, by the way? Uh, Nathan. Nathan, okay. I will get it by the end of the semester. So, all right, so then, yeah, you press me to play. So I can find the common uh, order. Uh -huh. Yeah, so this is what I was talking about. Okay. Like, this is probably the method most of you learned. Um, and it's fine, you can solve it. It's usually a little bit more cumbersome to solve yeah. than the residual method. Uh -huh. But I did this for the quiz or not the quiz assessment, but I got it wrong. And I'm just wondering why. So and after I like I submitted uh, the assessment and this is like I tried checking in the calculator and I got the same answer. Thank 
to lose this one. Answer was. Oh, the answer here it says negative point to eight. I think I did this twice too. There's, I attempted this twice. And Is I got, it the same? No, it's a different one. It was a different one. But I got it wrong again. I checked double check. It was the same form now. Um, it was the same form now. I hit this one. And it's zero, which really confuses me because. Uh, I attempted two, and none of them were <laughs> zero. So um, that's why I'm like I'm questioning if whether I'm doing this wrong. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you did the first one, which is correct. So it must be on my side that I have an error again. Bum that I have two errors. And this was which assessment? <clears throat> this is the second one. Second so the, the first and the second are quite similar. And I didn't really have any problems doing the first one. But then I tried doing the second one. Oh, wow, yeah. I had the total wrong formula in that one. This must have been two, three, B one. Yeah. Awesome. 
So if you submitted the work, that would be yeah, and the that's one. correct. Okay. okay. asking for the two. Yeah, this one's going to be zero. Oh, it's going to be zero? So for so yours is going to be in which one is going to be the variable? <clears throat> so it will be the. Should be B mine. Here it's B. So S plus four squared, right? Okay. And so when you take the derivative of that function, you put B in S, and then it's at S equals minus four. And so all of this ends up just, it should manipulate, it should equal zero, like when you plug all these in. So. Oh. Yeah. Not sure. so I think it might probably be in the system of linear equations. Yeah, it would. I think it would be a math mistake. If you yeah. want to email me, I can look through and try and see if I can see where the math is. Do you mind going through this method? Because I'm still uh, kind of I'm still kind of confused on how you use like when you derive like derivative. different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or like if we can discuss this other class too. If you, if you're, uh, I think everybody will probably want to. Uh, okay. So we can talk about that. Okay. Oh, it's really good. 
No, it's minus six over two. So that's minus three. <laughs> Sorry, I just miswrote it. I didn't mean to write it over. Over two is minus six over two, which is minus three. Everything is A. Oh, 
On which one? When you have two x plus fourteen equals a over nine, shouldn't one of them be minus? Yep. Yep. It's one plus minus roots. Yeah, I have an I have an error here. Somebody else see the other error? Minus. Sorry, which one? My brain minus one. So it's the one wherever you multiply it. So if I multiply by this one, that root is a minus three minus four J. So that's why I evaluated it the negative three minus four J. But I have a sign error here somewhere. So minus eight J. So you said it is in the minus eight J. So when I bring it up. So the minus J becomes a plus J. Oh yeah, it should still be a minus on the bottom. Wait a minute. That'd be a plus J. Oh, that is right. So minus J. Seeing where it is. And using the what? Sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry. The next one. This is called, yeah, this is called residue method. So you can do the, the cross multiplication. Is that the one you mean? 
Yes. Where you the patient's very like the like you can like so they should they should be like the methods are just different, but they should equal the same value. So if you like to use a different method, you can. If you want to like cross multiply it and solve for A and B by cross multiplying the whole thing and doing it as, as one, you can. This is just like separating them out to find them at different times or different sections of it. Yeah, this, this one just is a little bit easier to just multiply it once and then I find this method easier to use. All right, let me pull um, them back from the breakout room. Okay. All right, I'm going to wait a minute for everybody to come back from the breakout room. All right, question. Sorry, you've had your hand up for a while. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Let me wait for them to come back in for one second and then I'll go through that. Okay. All right. So, a um, couple questions has come up. One was how do I transfer from rectangular coordinates to the polar coordinates? So, let's just do a quick review on that. Um, so I had J plus one was my rectangular form. So remember, this is rectangular form. And translating from the rectangular or converting from the rectangular form to the polar form is what we're looking at to try to match the table. So we notice in the tables that there's no, it, nothing here that has a rectangular form. So that's why I transfer into the, the polar because I see like this one here has e to the j, which is gonna be the polar form. So I think that's the only other one. So the, the two on the bottom are the ones we can get to polar form. Otherwise I need to get like either the cosine, sine, you know, the match, trying to match any of those this form doesn't look like it's going to move to a sine cosine. So, um, and it doesn't just have like a real number of omega. So, and I don't have just one S. So anyway, going back there. So polar form from rectangular form. If I have a J plus B, this is the rectangular form. And then to convert to the polar, it's a squared plus b squared. The square root of it is the magnitude. And then e to the minus j inverse tangent of b over a. So remember from a vector, if I was to plot this, this is my real and imaginary planes. Oh, whoops, sorry, I wrote that wrong. It was supposed to be a plus bj. A plus BJ, there we go. So the A part is the real, so it goes over to the real of A and it goes up B. And my vector is to that point 
in that direction. So then I can rewrite that as R and this is theta. Sorry, this is not a minus, this should be plus. Sorry, plus inverse tangent of the imaginary part over the real part. Imaginary over real, yeah. Okay, did I just totally confuse you guys? Okay, all right, good. Because I think I just said it differently than I wrote. So, sorry about that. Yeah. So, Y is B and then the X is A. So. so, the inverse tangent of the imaginary over the real, which is B over A or X over Y. And it's just, yeah, it's just a normally a positive. So, it's J raised to the, the theta. So theta is determined by your real and imaginary. So you have to also be cognizant of which quadrant, because if you have a negative and a negative, you're going to be get still a positive inverse tangent, but it's actually going to be 180 degrees plus that. So be cognizant of what, where are you in this real imaginary plane for the value of that theta. Yes. Explaining the, the steps after you the A, or the like. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, on, um, okay. So, going back to like solving this. So, the first step in solving this is to figure out, factor it. So, I use the quadratic equation again to factor that into the roots. And so I have the form of A over this complex number plus B over the complex number. So now what I'm doing is, you know, you can cross multiply and then solve both A and B at the same time if you want. But the residue method is just to multiply and look at just the A portion and just the B portion. So to do that, I just take the original equation so if this is my f of s, so for a, I'm going to multiply it by whatever's on the bottom. So I take f of s and I multiply it by what a is over. So doing that, the can it cancels out what's on the bottom. And then I solve with the s of whatever that root is. So it would be s is equal to a minus 3 minus 4j. So I just plug that in. So the two times the S value plus 14. And then on the bottom, this is the S minus three minus four J plus three minus four J. Does that help? A little bit. How can you multiply the top? So I'm, I'm, um, how do I say this? So I'm doing this in two parts to find A and B. So I am multiplying this portion on both sides. So when I do that, how do I say this? Um, Oh, okay. It ends up, yes, I'll have that on the top, but then that ends up influencing the value for B. <laughs> okay, yeah, that, that, okay, I see that. So I'm kind of sectioning it off into doing them in parts, and then I'm adding them together. Yeah, and then he said solve for S equals negative 3. This is 4J. Uh-huh. That's on the right. Yep. So that's this. Over here, I just plug that in as the S value. And then I know that B is going to be the complex conjugate of A, just because of the minus J. 
And so I can go through and solve that one, or I can just note that it's a complex conjugate. So the solution for that one is just gonna be a minus J of that. But the steps of that would be exactly the same. So I would multiply that portion with just the S plus three minus four J. And then that would substitute as a S is equal to minus three plus four J. And then I would end up with that same value. So now once I have A and B, I'm gonna match that up to the table. And I notice that I can, because I manipulated that from rectangular form into the polar form, that this looks like a square root of two multiplied by all of this. So then I can just take out the square root of two because it's a constant and that multiplies by the answer. And so that's why the, my, the square root of two comes down and then I have a two E, A in this case is three and B is four and then theta is the 45 degrees. So I plug in those values for each one. And that's how I get to the solution. Okay, questions? More practice? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. All right, questions about the steps though here? Any questions about the steps? Yes. Yes. So this is the assessment is to do. Um, so, so far we've looked at just single um, unique roots. And then we've looked at multiple roots last time. And then now this is a complex root. So those are the three main ones you're gonna see with the problems that we always have is that it boils down to one of these three forms. And so these are the common ones you'll see this distinct root, I said novel or unique root, repeated real roots, distinct complex, and then repeated complex. So all of our systems always end up looking like one of these forms. So you're always gonna know that you wanna manipulate it into that polar form if it's complex. And yeah, you'll always want those polar forms for the complex, yes. Okay, so for the multiple repeated complex roots, you're gonna do the same thing as the repeated real, you can note that those are very similar. The difference is that you just have the cosine. So you're gonna take still the derivative. You're just gonna have a complex derivative in there. So you'll use this same method where you take the, um, you differentiate it and it will be just a complex differentiation. So there'll be a complex number in there. And that's gonna be the difference there. But you'll take the derivative and then you'll take the second derivative and it's one over two for the second derivative to find those. So remember you're taking the derivative of the S part of it and the complex will just be treated like a complex number. So it just, or just a number. So you keep that there, but if it's like J plus one times S, S squared, it would become like two J plus times J plus one S. So you just treat it like it's a, a number for the complex portion of it. So yeah, you don't differentiate the complex portion, you just treat it like a number, but it's in the complex complex form of it. Okay. All right, so I had another question about the roots. So I wanted to go back to that problem just to review. So on the on the com or on the repeated roots, you're doing the same thing where the form of it is a over like s plus one, then it's b over s plus two squared, and then c over s plus two cubed. So to find each one, C, you're gonna multiply it by the bottom part, which is gonna be S plus two cubed. So that one is evaluated at S equals minus two. 
So this again is just the F of S times the S plus two cubed. And then for B, you're going to differentiate it. So this is the differentiation of the S plus two cubed F of S. So you can just look at this portion of it and then differentiate that. And then you evaluate it again at S equals minus two. And then for A, it's the second derivative. So you take the first portion, which is the B part <laughs> cubed F of S, and then you differentiate it again and you divide it by a half. And then again, evaluate it at S equals minus two. So I find this easier than multiplying the whole equation out, but if you find it easier to multiply, you know, cross multiply the whole thing out and then solve for A, B, and C, you know, you can do that. I just, I do find this method easier. For different, yeah, for sections of it, yeah, just you can use a calculator too. Um, you have to just be careful with the calculators because, as I said, like you have to be aware of like your angles, like which quadrant are you actually in. And so a calculator would come out and say, you know, if I was negative one and negative one down, it's going to be a plus 45. But you have to know, like, okay, that's actually 180 plus 45. Um, so you do need to kind of understand those parts of it, but, you know, as long as you're understanding that and just using the calculator to differentiate or, yeah. All right, other questions? Questions? Okay. You guys probably want more problems of the partial fraction, don't you? Okay. Okay. Let me grab. Okay. E and F. All right, so find the inverse Laplace um, transform for the following. All right, so find the inverse Laplace transform of this equation. One thing to note is when you see an E automatically in there, look and see if it's one of the properties. So with the property, if you have just a constant that the um, time domain is multiplied by a constant, if you have an E in the um, S domain, you can see that it's a time shift in the time domain. Yes? Are you gonna walk us through the problem or? You guys are gonna try it on your own? You want me to walk you through it instead? <laughs> okay, I'm having mixed uh, things. So I'll start you off and then let you guys go with it and then come back to it. But do know, like when you have an E, it can either be a time shift, as you see here. Oh wait, wrong one. 
All right, so E in the S domain is gonna be a time shift in the time domain. And so for this problem, you note that you have this portion of it is not gonna be a part of the, the decomposition. So you're going to just keep that constant and then you're going to evaluate the S over, or S minus eight over S plus two, S squared plus 16. So the first step here is to do what? Okay, so we need to first put this into a fraction. So S, S squared is going to be a minus 16 square root of minus 16. So that becomes an S is four plus or minus four J, right? So now we're gonna do leave the E to the minus six S and now it's gonna be an A over S plus two, B over S plus four J, Said it, wrote it backwards, 4J. <laughs> and then a C over S minus 4J. So I can. I can write it here, S plus 4J, S minus 4J. All right, so just ignore the E to the minus 6S as you find each of these A, B, and C. So go ahead and take a minute. And for those of you who just wanna wait a second, I'll give you guys an opportunity to try to solve this and then we'll go through the solution. I think I saw another hand, you're good. All right, I'll put you guys in the breakout room online to try to work on this. I'm going to 
All right, so for the solution of this one, um, for A, I multiplied it by S plus two. So then the S plus twos cancel, and then I solve it at S equals minus two. And so that gives me a one. For B, it is um, S plus four J. So that becomes solving it at S equals minus four J. And so plugging that in, I get the minus 4j, minus 4j plus 8 on the top, and then a minus 4j plus 2, and then a minus 4j plus 4j becomes minus 8j on that bottom. And then I multiply that through, and then I'm in rectangular form. So now I want to change it. If you remember, for, for adding and subtracting, rectangular form is good. Multiplication and division, you want to do polar form. And so I changed it to polar form. And so I can divide them. And then I see that the top and the bottom magnitudes are actually the same, so that goes to one. And then ej to the inverse tangent of for the top one is 32 over 16. But again, that's um, minus 16 and up, so it's gonna be in the second quadrant. So this is minus 16 plus 32, so I need to find that theta. And so that's 180 degrees minus the 32 over 16. And then the other vector ends up being a minus 16 and a minus 32. 
So I have to find this angle here, which is 180 plus the value that I find there. So that's where I get the 180 minus 63 and the 180 plus 27. So then when I have, remember, um, e to the j, So remember the property of the exponent is when you have an exponent divided by another exponent, you can actually take the negative of those angles. So I can bring up, you rewrite this in a different way. <laughs> So when you're dividing, you can actually bring up the e to the minus j. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's like I cannot write today. Um, when you bring it up, it becomes an e to the minus j. And so then you can add those together as theta one minus theta two. And so that becomes e to the minus j 90 degrees. So, I note that when I do the C, it's actually just the complex conjugate of B. So I can multiply all those out and do the same thing. But if I note that it's the complex conjugate, I just reverse the J. So it becomes J plus 90 degrees. And then I use the forms of um, each one of these. And I note what A is and B and theta. And then I just plug those in to get that section for the inverse or inverse Laplace to get the time domain. Yes. Sorry. Or come up. All right. I'll see you guys. See you on Wednesday. Make sure to do the assessments. On this, uh -huh. the box table. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Okay. I'm kind of confused right here because you're saying that we're looking at uh, the, there's like the frequency shift right here, and then there's the time shift. So you have to just look at what form do you have in the S domain. So, so this one we have an E multiplied by that. So that's in the S domain, and then this right here would be in the time domain right yep. here. And that's how you tell the difference between the two? Yep. So in our equation here, this is what's given in, as in the S domain. OK. And so oh, here we go. So because we're in the S domain, that's why we use it that way. OK, that, that makes sense. That's, that's what I was getting confused on right there. I saw a good question, but I think there's a one. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. I guess, like, if you're going up here, you know, so, like, when you're looking at when you're adding and subtracting the 180 on the, uh -huh. the angle right here, yeah. my question is, like, right here in this one, like, if you're in the fourth quadrant, would that uh -huh. be subtracting 180 once again? So with that one, you're going to find um, the, the angle will be here. Mm -hmm. And so you'll have to do um, just a negative of whatever you get. OK. So what you're doing right here, I'm kind of getting confused on that. You have a theta, and then you're adding or subtracting with the 80, right? Yeah. So if you had, color. say, like 270 degrees, is it? So if you have a vector here, it's mm -hmm. going to be a plus and a minus. Yeah. So <laughs> it's going to give you um, so this theta three, it's going to give you, you know, you're going to have a negative value. 
Mm -hmm. you get it? So say it was a one minus one. You're going to get negative 45 when you put it in the calculator. Yeah. And that negative 45 is accurate because this is just three, you know, it's going to be negative 45. Yeah. So you could either do 360 minus 45 and get the whole angle around or just yeah. do negative 45. I don't know if so that makes sense. 360 minus the 45? Yeah. So you're finding a positive like the other. So say this was a negative 45 is what you end up getting in your calculator. Mm -hmm. So then this would be 180 minus 45 would be the whole. So you could, sorry, 360. Oh my goodness. Because that would be like, that would be wait a minute. Because um, that would be like going around in a circle, you're saying. Oh, I am confusing myself. Sorry. Because that would be a 180, right? Yeah. Because we're using it in terms of 180, because we want to get from pi to negative, well, from pi over 2 to negative pi over 2, right? Yeah. Because that's the domain of it. Yeah, so this would give you negative 45. And then. So that would be accurate. So you just you can just leave that one as negative forty five. You don't have to do one eighties. The one eighties are when you're in the these two quadrants. Okay, and okay, that makes sense. So like, simply you're just gonna. So this one, note that this one gave us a negative sixty three, but that's not accurate if we leave it as negative sixty three, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to take it's actually one eighty minus the sixty three. Okay. So then that becomes that angle. And then right here, we're in the, this right here in this lower portion. Yeah, so that gives you a positive 27 when you put that in the calculator. And then you have to add 180 to get you back have to, to that. Yep, you have to add 180 to get into this quadrant. OK, that makes sense. Thank you. So that's what I was talking about. You have to just know which quadrant you're in. OK, thank you. For what your calculator gives you out. Because it will give you a positive and negative, but that's not, if you're not in those two quadrants, you either have to take 180 Minus that one or 180 plus it. Okay. I think I'll have to review that. Thank you. Uh -huh. yeah. Hi. Just a quick question about the um, transforming from the polar coordinates to here. Yeah. So, how do we know that our um, theta here would be a negative 90? So that then becomes plus 90. Degrees? So, when you look at this compared to the form, you see that this is a plus angle with the plus. And so since that. that's a negative up there, then that has to be the negative 90. Does that right. make sense? Yeah. So it's just a comparison of what this equation is. So um, this is the solution when S equals this value. So when you write it in the factored form, it becomes a positive oh. and then Okay. Does that make sense? Because it's S equals this value yeah. from the quadratic of formula. So in the factored form, that becomes a plus. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes okay. sense. All right. Thank yeah. you. Uh -huh. I also have a question. Yeah. If that's all right. Yep. So right here, when we're doing this repeated root right here, uh -huh. we would start with like, I know that we're going to have this S cubed to be C, right? This is going to be s plus three cubed, uh -huh. and then like so on until you get to c over s plus one. Yeah, or b and then a. Yeah. Yep, yeah, b and a. A, b. Well. Yep. I'm just. Uh -huh, so that one would be squared. Yep. So why do we start like with this function first off? Because like I know that it'll cancel out because you're like you have these two functions that will cancel out. Uh huh. But well, why are we putting the C right here at the beginning instead of like, why couldn't we just have this as A and then go to B or we'll go to C? They're just variables. So you could, you could change them as A, B, C if you want. So but you just have to note that for this one, it's, you know, S plus three cubed. Yeah. That's supposed to be cubed, but it's really horribly written. <laughs> That's okay. I'm just, just, they're just variables. So you can swap them and do this is variable A, this is variable B, and this is variable C. So it just kind of makes... Or E, F, G, whatever you want to call the variables. <laughs> they're just a variable name. I just like to go in steps. I think, okay, uh -huh. A, B, C. Yeah, you can do it. Just note that this would be then associated with the step of A. First derivative is the next one. 
And then the third one is the one when it doesn't have anything. Okay. And then you're just basically plugging in what that, that root is at that value. Yep. Thank you. Uh -huh. No problem. Hi, did you have a question, Fei Yang? Did you have a question? All right, did you have any questions before I log off? Thank you. All right, see ya.